Great, thank you very much for the introduction and thank you for the invitation. It's a pleasure to be in such a vivid panel. I'm not going to say further about this, but only to refer to the fact that we have seen features of the populist discourse, we have seen features of Eurosceptic parties. What I'm going to present is why these parties are successful at the polls or are unsuccessful at the polls. I'm going to say we in this presentation, and that's not because I'm speaking about myself with the royal we, but because I have a colleague. This is research conducted together with Sorina Suarez from the University of Florence, and it's an ongoing research. We're going to look at more post-communist countries. What you will see today is evidence from three post-communist countries. So the starting point of our uh, entire uh, idea was the fact that there is an increasing support for uh, this sort of political parties for uh, um, uh, populist political parties. No, I'm fine. It's for the recording, please. I can have it. Yeah. It's for the recording. I understand. For history. Yeah. I'll try to, try to keep this. So, uh, what we wanted to do is to explain what are the features that are actually uh, helping these political parties to be more successful than others. And that was exactly the research question that we came across, and that is what we try to, uh, to answer. Why are these parties successful? Some of them in Eastern Europe, some of them in Western Europe. In the morning talk, we heard about the success of some of these parties. In, the, in what Ovidio said earlier on, we heard about what happened in Eastern Europe. There are two major approaches in, pol in the political science literature. The first approach to explain the success of, of these sort of parties uh, looks at the macro factors. Macro means at the level of society. What happens? Is there a financial crisis? Is there a corruption problem? Is there an issue of democracy? Is there a failure of democracy? That is one strand of literature. The other strand of literature looks at the micro factors. That means individual level. What do people want? They want a better economic situation, they want a good performance of the government, they no longer want corrupt people. So all these things are in the literature. And in case uh, you, you are interested, we can get into details after the presentation. But what is important is that almost nobody looks so far at what we call the meso factors. What is in between society level and individual levels, and in between are the political parties, is the supply side, why, what they offer us. So our idea was that something in their offer makes them somehow attractive and makes them successful. And in that sense, when it comes to the meso level, to the political parties, we looked at two major components. The first of them is the personalization of politics. We see an increasing number of political parties heavily depending on their leaders. We associate a political party with a leader more and more often. When we say CDU in Germany, we automatically say Angela Merkel. When we say uh, uh, Front National in France, we automatically say Marine Le Pen. And the examples can go on. And the second dimension at which we looked is the party organization. Because every political party that, needs, that uh, has to ensure survival must have a party organization, one way or another. So this being said, our next step was to look at what has been done so far. And so far, these two components were used to define populist parties. As uh, our colleague uh, Sergio Mishko said in the beginning, populist parties are defined by other characteristics. I'm not going to go through them again. But keep, keep in mind the slides that he presented, and that is basically what defines a populist party, not the organizational features. Because so far, very, uh, qu quite a lot of uh, scholars tried to look at the role of leader as a savior, because populist parties present this, sa this leader as a messiah, as a savior of the nation, and they look at the leader-centered organization. So as long as the political party doesn't have an autonomous organization and everything depends on the leader, they said it is a populist party. Well, we say the opposite, and what we want to argue is that Populists can be defined relative to their discourse, exactly the argument put forth by Sergio Mishko in the beginning. And party organization is likely to explain electoral performance and low volatility. Volatility means how many people change their mind between two elections. So for example, today you vote with the Greens, in four years you decide to vote for the Social Democrats. That means you are a volatile elector, a, a volatile voter. So in that sense, our key argument is that this party organization and the leader can enhance the chances of populist parties 
to maintain a very a high rate of success and to even achieve higher success. In, in, and the mechanism is twofold. The mechanism looks at the leader because it he or she communicates with the voters in a direct manner via internet, via uh, media channels, via social media, via TV, and then the organization backs the leader, the party organization. Having a territorial coverage throughout the country will help the leader with that. So in that sense, as long as a political party has the two, it is very likely to be successful. Well, in studying this, what we did, we, we fancy uh, call this a research design, but it's basically how we proceeded. What we did, we, we selected three political parties based on the most similar system design. In other words, we wanted to keep some issues, some uh, variables, some factors constant in order to explain differences between political parties. And we selected three political parties that were recently very successful or successful in relative terms in their national elections. And those are uh, Bulgaria without censorship in Bulgaria, in brackets you have the acronym, Party of the Socialists in Moldova and the People's Party Dan Diaconescu in Romania. We didn't want to take radical populists. So we didn't want to take populists that are also radical right at the same time because that's a different category. There's, there's a lot of discussion going on, but this is the profile of the three parties. So what we did, we had a qualitative analysis on primary sources. We took a lot of party documents. We took a look at their websites, at the discourse of their leaders, at what they do and how they do it. And we focused on two di dimensions. We looked at the political experience, role, and selection of their leaders. And we look at how many branches they have throughout the country, how many territorial organizations, and how many members these political parties are. And this is what we observed. Let's start with the Bulgaria without censorship. The party was founded in 2014 and already got very successful in its first election in 2014. Uh, this is the name of the leader. You don't have to remember it. It is just there for uh, history purposes. Uh, Nikolai Barekov, and he was elected by 5,000 delegates. The funny thing is that we never know how those 5,000 delegates were appointed. We don't know how many members this party has. We just know that he was elected by 5,000 delegates because he says so. Quite often, he quotes this as an issue of legitimacy. He originates outside the establishment, that means outside the political elite, and heavily criticizes the political elite. He comes, for, uh, he says that he's going to be, uh, he's an independent, he has the strength to see all the problems in the system. It is very nice that all those who oppose him within the party are considered traitors. This is a feature that is quite frequent to these sort of political parties in, in several, in, in the post-communist uh, countries, but we, we can get that, to that in a moment. And uh, what he did, he, he was a promoter of a very strong anti-establishment discourse in the sense that nothing that belongs to the political system and nothing that belongs to the po current political elites is good. So this is his pr uh, profile as a leader. In terms of party organization, uh, we see that it, is, it has a very weak territorial coverage and heavily relies on the leader. So they have a coverage only in 27 uh, large villages, uh, cities and villages in Bulgaria, which is by far not enough, plus Sofia, the, the capital, 28. It has a hierarchical structure in which the leader is extremely powerful and basically says everything that happens. And this is a very funny thing, because immediately after formation, the party accepted a lot of members of parliament, so MP there stands for member of parliament, accepted a lot of parliamentarians that left political parties that were going down in the opinion polls, so it took them with it, uh, with the party, but as soon as the elections took place, those people got re-elected as members of parliament, they left the party again. So they were for, for a very short period of time. That shows a lot of instability in terms of organization, because if you have a lot, many people coming in and many people leaving after two, three, four months, then you have a problem in terms of organization. So that is the story with Bulgaria uh, without censorship. The story with the socialists, the party of socialists in the Republic of Moldova, it's pretty similar because although they were founded in 1997, they won absolutely no seat until 2014. And apparently their success comes with the nomination, with the election of a new leader, Igor Dodon, who was selected in 2011. He was endorsed by the Russian uh, population or pro-Russia because if, 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 you, if you know, in Moldova there is a pro-Russian population and a pro-Romanian population. Uh, he, he was a former member of the Communist Party and that explains to some extent 
widely sort of Russian endorsement. And in, at, the same, at the same time, he was basically following this, this uh, endorsement, and he was a promoter of a collaboration with Russia, promoting an anti-EU, anti-Romanian uh, partnership of the Republic of Moldova. And he decided that the party will do much better if he takes all the decisions, which is a fair thought. Um, in terms of, given this type of, of, of leadership, it's very obvious that the party organization cannot be strong. It's almost impossible to have the two coexisting. So this is why we have a weak territorial coverage. Uh, what, what he says he does is decision through deliberation because according to him, more than half of the members are involved in the decision making process. Unfortunately, we could not find evidence of that thing apart from his discourses. We're still digging for it. Uh, what happens is that there is a very rigid hierarchical structure with a great role for the leader. So if you, someone has to decide in the political party how many tissues they have to buy for the party, they have, he must be asked, the, the, the party leader. It gets as serious as that. So everything basically goes through the leader. So what he says is that membership developed after 2011, and in three years, he's, uh, he claimed that he raised from 700 to 2,000 members. The problem is that there are no records of these members. So practically everything we have at the moment is what, what he claims in various statements, but, and we have asked for the official documents for, for, uh, from this party. We're still waiting for them. We asked for two months. Now, uh, the, People's Party Dan Diakonescu in Romania. It was founded in 2011, and the name of the leader is in the title of the party, so you can sort of imagine what sort of party is that. Uh, it is a business party model in the sense that the guy uh, started as a journalist, owned a TV station, centered his entire political campaign around the TV station. Uh, he didn't invite any candidates apart from those of his own party. And it was, it, it was quite a nice campaign from an analytical perspective. From a voter perspective, not so nice. Uh, also originates outside the establishment and always claimed that he has a better perspective than the politicians, a neutral perspective, the perspective of the people, as Sergio said earlier. And he had a very authoritarian style of ruling the party, even deciding how much money people who want to run on the, uh, for the party should give the party, should donate the party. He, d he took every, every dis decision in that sense. And of course, a promoter of an anti-establishment uh, uh, discourse. In terms of a party organization, it is required by the legislation in Romania to, have a, to form a party to have at least 25,000 members. Two years after the party was fund, uh, formed, uh, when, when the court actually checked the list, more than one-fifth was formed of dead people or people who did not uh, reach the age of 18. So practically there, there was a problem with, with the documentation, but until then uh, the initial list was supplemented with other members, so it was fine. So in that sense, PPDD is the only one that has a minimal party, of, uh, party membership. Uh, what it did, uh, uh, similar to the party in Bulgaria, it accepted defecting MPs, that means MPs that left other parties, and lost many MPs in the aftermath of the 2014 elections, and that basically collapsed the party. It, it has a highly hierarchical structure and, again, a weak territorial coverage, because once the MPs, the members of parliament, left the party, also te many territorial organizations left together with the party. So what we, can we see? At the end of the day, looking at these three political parties, we see a lot of resemblances. And we see the fact that it was a one-shot victory for them. One-shot victory meaning they made it to parliament. But roughly none of these parties stands a solid chance of winning seats in the next parliament for two reasons. And those reasons are that they remain a one-man show. As soon as that person has a problem, uh, Dan Diakonosky has a problem with justice in Romania, in the uh, in, uh, Republic of Moldova, the, lead, the, political, uh, the leader of the political party lost visibility because he no longer gets invited to events. Whereas in Bulgaria, the, the person got in the shadow of another, he's accused of being the puppet of another politician. So as soon as all these one-man shows have problems, the political party collapses, mostly because there is an underdeveloped organizational structure that doesn't allow populist parties in, in the three countries to be successful on a continuous basis. So the answer to the question that we ask, electoral success beyond leaders, not really. That, that's what happens. As long as the leader goes down, the party goes down with the leader. This can be good news, this can be bad news. It depends from the perspective. 
What is very important to remember is that the strong appeal, because these parties have an extremely strong appeal. It has an anti-establishment appeal. It tries to mobilize all the dissatisfied people in the population is not backed by strong organizations. If that happens, we will notice what we notice in Western Europe, where this populist party get increasingly popular and they stay there. There are very few cases of political parties that go down. So practically, if there is mimetism, if they learn from the experience of the Western European counterparts, we will probably notice exactly the same thing in Estonia. Thank you very much.